How many of you are glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? There you go. So obviously this morning we have a bit of a sparse team, um, but the Lord is good, you know? We can still worship, amen? But I just want to lift up some people in prayer, uh, quite a few people, Chris and Naima. They're at Josiah Center um, with, uh, is that, are they there this morning? They're there with Pastor Doug Stanton this morning doing worship. So we're just going to lift them up in prayer. But also um, my pastor mama, Pastor Sarah, and Andrew, even though he doesn't come on Sunday mornings, they are both sick. So that's why they're not here. So we're just going to lift up them in prayer as well as Chris and Naima um, before we worship. So if y'all would just pray with me, dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for Chris. We thank you for Naima, Lord. We thank you for Pastor Sarah. We, we thank you for Pastor Andrew and anyone who may be having sickness in their body. But Lord, first, I just pray for Chris and Naima. Lord, I pray that you would bless them, Lord, that you anoint their hands to play for you, Father God, that they would solely be instruments for you to honor you and to glorify you, Father God. And we just lift up Pastor Sarah um, and Pastor Andrew, and we just pray for full healing in their body. Bodies, Father God. You are Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals, and your blood made a way, Lord Jesus. So we plead the blood over them right now in the name of the Father, Lord. And we just pray healing in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Y'all ready to worship today? This morning? Amen. Let's go. you, Lord, as the Spirit was moving over the water, the Spirit crowned over us, come rest on us, come rest on us, as the Spirit was moving over the water, the Spirit come over us, come rest Now, spirit, when you move, you make my heart. Now, when you feel. 
Just raise your hands in the presence of the Lord. We just thank you, God. Let it be more than a song. We want more of you. Fill us to overflowing. We thank you, Father God. You are the all-consuming fire. Let your fire consume anything in us that is not of you, that's not good for us. Let your all-consuming fire consume the things that consume us, the things of the world, till what's left is just a passion for you, God. Hallelujah. You know the beauty of a song like this is? Even when we're in eternity in heaven, this will never grow old or be out of style. We'll never stop singing and declaring, I want more of you, God. Because we'll never get to the place where, we're, where we are full of God. There will always be a greater understanding. There will always be a greater love for us, a greater passion for all of eternity. Because He is an infinite God and we're not. We will grow in our understanding of who He is and who He is to us. Amen? Isn't that an awesome thing? Hallelujah. I just, even as, as we were praising that and, pra and singing those songs, I just heard the Spirit of the Lord saying that know that it all belongs to me. Or the Lord saying, know that it all belongs to me. And what I was, I was thinking, even just with this song, Set of Fire, sometimes in some circles, we think of fire belonging to the enemy, to the devil and hell and things like that. But the fire belongs to God. Amen? It all belongs to God. Sometimes we look at the devil, and the Scripture says he goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he might, may devour. No, he's the scary lion. No, he goes about like a roaring lion. God is the lion of Judah. Right? The, the actual lion, the actual roar belongs to God. The enemy just twists and perverts what God has already created and already done. Do you know even addiction? Addiction is a perversion of something of God. Being addicted to drugs and alcohol, sex, our phones, all those are not good things. But you know we are designed to be addicted to God? To just like we're crying, I want more of you. I need more of you. The enemy just comes and perverted that. And I heard the Spirit of the Lord saying this morning, know that it all belongs to me. And I heard the Lord saying, though you may be going through something and experiencing something right now, and it looks like the enemy is coming against you. It looks like there is the fire of destruction all around you. Trust me, I know about this. We experienced this a week ago at our house. But the Lord is saying, no, that that doesn't belong to the enemy. It belongs to me. And the Lord says, I put a word in your mouth and you can speak life and you can speak transformation because I am the God of life and the God of transformation. So I hear the Lord saying, take what the enemy has meant for evil and turn the declaration around. Find the purity in it. Find the original intent in it and begin, begin to declare that over the situation. And I hear the Lord saying, watch and see how I will work and I will transform even the, the, the things the enemy has done for your good. Hallelujah. If you believe that, just give him a praise. Amen. Before we move on here, just really quick. Um, I know we opened up, we prayed for... Uh, for Sarah, for Andrew, and for, for people that weren't feeling well. But uh, is there anybody else here tonight, this morning? Uh, is there anybody else here this morning that, that is um, fighting something, that is not is under the weather, not feeling well? I know that, that Janice has been, but you've been doing better, but still. Anybody else? All right, we got there. Anybody on the other hands? They just, you just, I know, I, I'm st I still got the cough drop. It's been like over a month. It's getting better, but I still got it. All right? So... So they're there. Okay. All right. So can we just, just pray for one another? Uh, you know, we've seen cancer healed right here in this house, right, recently. All right? But there's nothing too big and there's nothing too small for God. And we can pray for coughs and colds and COVIDs and 
whatever, you know. Pastor Sarah might have just had some food poisoning or something. But let's just pray healing. God's a healing God. And so, Father God, we just pray for healing right now for everybody who needs it. Um, oh, I know Tony is, is suffering with a sore throat right now. So, so everybody that needs it, Father God, whatever, we, we just speak to these viruses and these illnesses and these lingering coughs and these lingering effects right now. Even the small things all the way up to the big things, Father God. We speak to it all. And we thank you that Jesus is the name above every name. That by his stripes we are healed. It's done. It is finished. Lord, we declare your healing. We know that it is done in heaven. That there's no sickness. There's no infirmity in heaven. And we know that heaven can manifest on earth. Lord, raise our faith. We declare and decree that heaven will manifest on earth. Bridge that gap until we see the manifestation for every single one. We thank you for, we praise you for, we thank you. You are the same. Come on. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not a respecter of persons. If he's done it before, he will do it again. Do you believe that? Right? Somebody say, he's going to do it again. Because he doesn't know any other way to do it. Amen? I can't tell you why the timing's different in different situations and, and, and things like that, because I'm not God. What I can tell you is prayer works. Amen. And we're just going to keep praying and keep praying until we see that thing manifest, until we see the healing. Hallelujah. So, Father God, we just thank you. We praise you. We give you all the praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah guys can be seated. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. I'm a little bit out on a limb this morning with, without Sarah here because normally we feed off each other. We go back and forth on Sunday mornings. But uh, but God is good. Holy Spirit is in the room. Amen. How many of you are glad the Holy Spirit's in the room? I know I am. It's much better when he's in the room and it's not just me. Amen. Amen. Well, you didn't you aimed a, aimed a little too fast there. No, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. But you know, um, Sunday mornings, Sarah and I typically don't have a plan. Um, we just kind of uh, maybe the night before on the drive here, we talk about it a little bit, or we have a, a, a thought or a dream in the morning. But mostly, we're just leaning and trusting in the Holy Spirit. What's that? Yeah. Um, But um, God always shows up, Amen. God always shows up, and this morning the Lord was was uh, just was downloading something to me and putting something on my heart, and it, it, it's a tricky thing I think as Christians, especially as as uh, prophetic Christians, when we um, we're pursuing the Lord with everything in us. When we're, we're trying to learn, we're trying to, you know, do what the Bible says, do what Jesus said, lay hands on the sick, uh, cast out demons, um, but also just trying to grow in our, our, our personal walk with God, growing the fruits of the Spirit and all these sort of things. And, and we have a heart and a passion for God, maybe a heart and passion for ministry. And you're going and you're pursuing these things. And many times we go and we pursue these things and we have this idea in our head how it's going to go. I can tell you this, when you start a church for the very first time, you have this idea in your head of how it's going to go. All these problems that other churches have, we got it figured out. We're not going to have those problems, right? And there's there is one way that you can you can um, start a church and not have those problems, and that that is you start a church with no people. That's the way. That's the solution that I found to that that issue. Because because the the problems just come with and that that by the way that includes me. So it's a church just like every Sunday morning we'll gather together and we'll all just leave the building so that God can have church without any issues because um, it's completely empty. And that's really the only way that, that you can't have that. But, but my, my point is this, is, is you, you know, and church is just a, is a good example because you have this vision of how things are going to go and what, what, what's going to happen and, and what you're going to do. But it doesn't just have to be church. It can be just, you know, maybe you, um, you went to, uh, you took a class on, on uh uh, healing and deliverance or on, on, you know, evangelism and praying for people. And you just have this passion to go out and to reach people and, and, and to get people saved and get people, you know, filled with the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord, right? And then 
things don't go the way you thought. You know, things don't go the way you thought. Um, and sometimes what can happen is, especially, especially I think, with, with prophetically minded Christians, is that, you know, we, we get a word from the Lord and, 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 and we, we believe we're hearing from him and we go. And the word's legitimate. You're hearing clearly. And then you go, and things don't just go the way that you thought they were going to go. And we feel kind of trapped in that direction. Because, you know, we kind of put ourselves out there with that. We said that the Lord told us to do this. And, 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 and we've we're, we got this direction going. We feel kind of trapped in it and, and have, obligated to see it through to the end. But you know, while I completely understand that and get that, and I'm very guilty of that myself, that is actually not a biblical pattern. It's not a biblical pattern. It's not a New Testament pattern. It's not an, a book of Acts pattern. And what, I guess what I'm trying to say is that in our journey, there is always a lot of course corrections. And a lot of times, it has nothing to do with you missing it, going the wrong direction, or anything like that. Course cor cor corrections are a part of our walk, a part of our journey. And we have to be okay with that and embrace that and know that that doesn't mean that you missed it. That doesn't mean that uh, you, know, you failed in some sort of way. That just means that uh, um, course corrections are a part of the journey. They're a part of the journey, amen? And I think sometimes, you know, I, I was just, I, I was just, you know, like I said, I was just thinking about this, and we get down on this. And actually, one of the reasons I was thinking about this is Sophia just started this week. She started um, High Praise Panama City School of Ministry. Um, and they're doing a big school, and she's doing it online, and it's in their, they're, they're partnering with an accredited university for people that want to get uh, degrees, but they also just have a, a ministry diploma that they're doing. And she started that. And the thing is, is uh, yeah, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So she'll be teaching us real soon. Um, but, uh, no, but she's been doing that since she was like 12. Um, that, just, that just means you're a sweet girl. Um, but, you know, the thing is, and, and I know Pastor Rob would be the first one to tell you this. Um, see, we, we've been connected to high praise for, uh, boy, 12, 13, 14 years, something like that. And we have heard, when Sophie was just a little thing, uh, we heard so many prophetic words about them doing a school of ministry. And they have tried to start it multiple times. And those multiple times, it just it never worked out. And I have heard word of the Lord from Apostle Robert, but also from guest ministers that come in from very in tune prophetic people saying that I see a school of ministry and I see it reaching the nations and things like that. And then they would try to start and it would kind of fizzle. Last time they tried to start and they just had it all planned and going, then then this little thing called COVID hit. Right? And, you know, monkey wrench and all that. And it would be really easy to look at that and say, well, you must have missed it. Because God said we're supposed to start a school, and we tried to start a school and it didn't work. We tried to start a school and it didn't work. We tried to start a school and it didn't work. But sometimes, you know, it can be a valid word. You just have to course correct and redirect and, and reconsider and, and reevaluate in order to, until you, you get on the right path in the right way, in the right timing, in the right situation. Amen. That doesn't mean that they had a wrong word. It means that for whatever reason, now is the time and now is the, is the season, right? And, I, and they have, I mean, it really, in this time, it, it came together in a crazy way. It came together in a crazy, crazy way with, with, with the right leadership, the right people, with the right experience, and the right timing when it comes to technology and things like that. So Sophia could take it. You know, back when they first had that word, technology wasn't a place where you could really do that. Not really. You know, it's just maybe in the infancy of, of that sort of stuff. But now things have changed. So, you know, actually, ironically, COVID built up the technology for at-home schooling in ways that, uh, that it just wouldn't have otherwise. So ironically, the one false start gave them the tools for the go season. With me? 
And, you know, this is, this is what actually got me thinking about it, was that. But then I also was thinking of all the different times that, um, that we've had to, just as a ministry ourselves, course correct. And, um, and, and try to figure things out. And here's the thing about that. Is, as long as you can stay true to who you are and still change your approach to things without being wrong or being a failure. You know that when Sarah and I started, I praise Brainerd Lakes. We had this vision we're just going to take and we're going to build off the momentum of high praise central Minnesota. We're going to do everything that we learned and we're just going to we're going to hit the ground running. And to a degree that happened. But not the way that we thought. Because it's amazing what a few counties in between the difference that makes. Y'all are different. Look at somebody say you're different. Right? In a good yeah, in a good way. You know, it's, it's not even it's not good, it's actually not good or bad. You're just different. This is a different region. It's a different region, even though I mean it's very different when we go down to high praise Panama City. We got states in between. They're in the in they're part of the Bible belt. But and Minnesota's definitely not. But I'm I was amazed at the difference and it, it it's subtle, but it's 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 also profound at the same time. Just be, like I said, just with a few counties in between. Things that work in St. Cloud don't work the same here. Things that people respond to there aren't the things that re- people respond to here. And we, it took some time, even though, you know, it took t- some time for us to learn that. It, part of the reason that we're doing the class we're doing, the SEND, the schooling that we're doing here at, at, at High Praise Brainerd Lakes, is what we learned about you, you guys in Brainerd. You guys love these classes and these teaching and getting deep in the Word, you, you guys really respond to that differently than they do in St. Cloud. Like, there's there's more of a hunger for that. And so we're like, well, we got all this stuff. Let's just make it a little bit more official. I mean, we already were doing it, but but uh, it's recognizing that. And here, so we, can, we, we begin to see these patterns, and then we adjust to fit that. We don't change who we are. We've never changed who we are. We, we adjust our approach a little bit here, a little bit there, so that the people and standing in front of us are better equipped to receive. You guys following me? And, and, and my point is this, is sometimes when we are faced with a situation, when we're looking at something and saying, you know, this isn't working. This isn't working. I thought God told me to do this, and I'm just struggling with this. And we feel obligated to, to stay the course and continue to do that. But it is completely fine to readjust, reevaluate, reapproach, maybe put something on the shelf and come back to it later. It's completely biblical. And I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about um, from the scriptures. The apostle Paul had lots of good plans. He was supposed to be apostle to the Gentiles. Woo! Go out and get them all saved, get them all baptized in the Holy Spirit. Yeah. You know what wasn't in those plans? Being beaten and thrown in jail. You know, it wasn't in those plans being shipwrecked. <laughs> I mean, the man spent more time running and or or in, in chains. You know, figuratively speaking, he was in house arrest for like two years. But you know what I mean. He spent more time doing that than he did actually preaching to people. So you know what? He had to adjust. You know how he adjusted? Instead of going from city to city and preaching, he wrote letters because he couldn't get there himself. And aren't you guys glad that Paul made that adjustment? Right? It's kind of an important adjustment for you and I. He probably thought, I'm a failure. I'm not doing what God called me to do. I'm supposed to be there with the people that I love, the people that I care about. I, I, I've been hearing about this Corinthian church. I need to be there to fix that mess. Right? Right? I got to send Timothy, and he's a kid, and he, I know he can do it, but I, I should be there. I should be there. But all I can do is write these letters. Oh, but boy, did God have a plan for those letters. But uh, you see what I'm saying? It would be really easy, I'm sure, because Paul's a human being, that there was moments where he felt like he was missing it. Like he was a failure, like like he was settling for less than what God had called him to do. 
You guys seeing this? But course correction is a part of ministry, and it's a part of being a Christian. Another great example with Paul. Um, Acts 16. Acts chapter 16 is the story of the, the, the slave girl with the spirit of divination, right? If you know the story, you know, they're, they're there and they're ministering, and, and Paul is, uh, is ministering this, this girl who is a slave girl. She, she, uh, she's a diviner. She's a, you know, maybe we call it a psychic or something today. And she's following them. Excuse me while I try to get my cough drop. She's following them and saying, these are servants of the Most High God. These are servants of the Most High God. Um, and, and in the surface, that would seem like a good thing, right? They are servants of the Most High God. But what she was really doing because of her masters is she was, and this is what a spirit of pythos does, that's what the divination means, pythos, is it's trying to squeeze the spirit out of the ministry. And what she was doing is saying, the, by saying these are servants of the Most High God, and she's equating them herself and her, her ministry to them and saying, see, we're no different, see, we're no different, see, we're no different. And she's trying to equate divination and psychic sort of abilities to the Holy Spirit. And then the Bible says, I think Paul had some grace because she was a little kid, probably. But there came a point where Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, not to the girl, you know, get out of her. And she was delivered that very hour. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Deliverance. Everyone should be happy. Not so much. Right? Because now her master's, their source of income was gone because the spirit is gone and she can't do, you know, what, what she was doing before. The power is gone. She's free, but they're mad that she's free. They get mad. They throw Paul and Silas in jail. Now, that leads to a whole thing where the Holy Spirit or the angels come and the, and the, and the chains fall down and the doors open and there's a revival in the, in the, in the, uh, in the prison, in the, in the prison, if, you know, the, the, prison keeper's family gets saved and there's all kinds of awesome things and Paul instead of sneaking out in the middle of the night he's like no 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 we're gonna going to confront the people that threw me in jail because what they didn't know is he was a Roman citizen and it was illegal for them to do that and so he confronts them to the to the, the, the very people that threw him in jail are now shaking in their boots begging him to just quietly go and not get them in trouble completely turn the tables See, I believe that Paul didn't just deliver a girl from a spirit of divination. He delivered a region from a spirit of divination by confronting the, the leadership, the ones that were holding that region captive and turning the tables on them through what he did with the little girl. Amen? So praise the Lord. A whole region gets free from a, spiritual, uh, from a territorial spirit of divination. Woo! You'd think people would be excited. No, the mobs chased him and followed him. The next place he goes to minister, they've all word has already gotten there before him. And the in the words that they use is those that turn the world upside down have come here as well. And the mobs try to chase him out and, and, and kill him. So he doesn't even get a chance to minister because word has spread that these are those that turn the world upside down. And so then they go to the next city and the mob follows them to the next city. With me? This is Acts. Now we're in Acts 17. Um, it follows them to the next city. It gets, gets so contentious. They're just like, okay, Paul, you, you, you just got to let things simmer down. What we're going to do is we're going to send you quietly in the night over here to Greece. Where you're going to hang low in Greece. We're going to meet you up, up there with you later. And um, let things simmer down. And then we'll head back. They're readjusting. Right? They're, they're, they're course correcting here. Because clearly, you're not being very effective in ministry when mobs are waiting for you. You can't preach the word, right? And, and they, it, it's, it's not going to be beneficial to just go from place to place to place, mob to mob to mob, and, and, and be running for your life. They have to figure this thing out, let things simmer down. So Paul goes to Greece, but he's Paul. So he can't not minister. And he goes around and he sees in Greece, they, they're very intellectual, and they want to learn everything, and they have all these different gods because Greece has a very different history than the Jews do. See, he was going in, in Jewish cities and, 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 and when he was being chased, but now he's in Greece where, where they have all these different gods and the marketplace, and they have this marketplace of ideas was kind of a Greek thing. And, um, and, and so they're, they're there, and he sees altars to this 
to this unknown God. Um, uh, and then he goes to this this place. Oh, I, I, I'm trying to remember the name. It's an Arca. It, it's an open coliseum with an open door sort of thing where they where they come and they just share ideas. And there's a bunch of leaders there, and they're just sharing these intellectual ideas. And they're talking about these things. And Paul uses what he saw in the marketplace, and he says, I see that you guys worship the unknown God, but let me tell you about the known God. That there is a known God who created the heavens and the universe. Because, see, they had a God for everything. You know, for the sky, for the water, for the, for the rain, for the, you know, whatever. They had a God for everything. God, and, and Paul says, no, there's one God, and he created it all. That was a new concept for them. And so they said, you know what? That's an interesting thing that you're talking about. Let us sit and listen and learn a little bit more. We want to hear more from you. And the, and the Bible says a few of them got saved. You know, not it was some not some massive revival. A few of them got saved, but, but the rest of them, they wanted to hear more. And it's a stark contrast between two regions that were not separated by that much distance. You got a bunch of angry mobs because you're preaching Jesus and a bunch of people that don't even understand the concept that God created, you know, of one God that created everything. Right? And so what Paul learned was that you have to have different approaches to different groups of people. Same God, same gospel, same Jesus, same message, but a different approach to be effective. And I believe it's a lesson that Paul learned because check out what he writes. See, all this happened. This this is in the book of Acts, and this is Acts 16, 17. So this is, um, you know, I think this is about 20, uh, somewhere around 20 years into um, after Christ had had um, had died, and about 25 years after that is when Paul. I might be getting the numbers wrong, but this approximate is when when they believe that Paul wrote the letters to the Corinthians. So my point is this: it's pretty clear in the chronology that this this whole thing that happened in Acts 16 and 17 um, happened about five years before he writes the letters to the Corinthians. So, so he has he learned something from this experience, and now he's he is writing to the Corinthians. But see if you can pick out what Paul what Paul is referencing when he writes to the Corinthians. Put the scripture up here. All right. So this is First Corinthians chapter one, verse twenty-one. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. All right? So this is kind of basically saying that, that you know, the, the wisdom of God confounds is foolishness to, to the wisdom of the world. We've heard this, right? But then he continues. Now notice this. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. You see that? He's identifying these two different groups, right? And, and, um, and I'll just finish the scripture off. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. All right, so again, so here's where we see it coming together. But but to those who are called, those or maybe a better way to put it, those who accept the call, is really what he's saying. Those who accept the call um, to to Jesus, because because God, Jesus is calling out to everybody. You know that that God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, so that we could all be saved, not just some of us, but not everybody answers that call. So those that are that re, that answer to the call, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And those two things get reconciled together. But let's go back back to this for a second here. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. What is he talking about here? He's talking exactly about what happened in Acts 16 and 17. He goes to Jewish cities, and he preaches Jesus, Christ crucified, and it's a stumbling block. They stumble and they want to kill him and throw him in jail. Why is that? A, why is the cross a stumbling block? Because they already understand the one true God. They knew the Torah. They knew Moses. They knew Abraham. They knew all that stuff. They knew the law. That wasn't a problem. Understanding that God created everything, that wasn't a problem for them. Got it. It's down. We've been doing this for centuries. 
but the cross. The cross, that was a stumbling block, right? That's what caused them to stumble and fall and get angry. But to the Jews, or to the Greeks, they had no concept of any of this history. So they had no concept of Messiah. Why would the cross be important to them? They didn't, they didn't know the significance of the cross, of a lamb, of any of that stuff. They had none of that history. So it all if you're trying to explain just Jesus to them without any of that backdrop, it seems foolish. You're like, you're overcomplicated. You think we're complicated with all these different gods? It's pretty simple. We need rain, we talk to this God. We need sun, we talk to this God. You know? We're, we're, somebody's sick, we talk to this God. You're making it really complicated with this whole cross and lamb and blood. I don't get it. See, it was foolishness to them. Same God, same mission, same missionary, different approaches because of different regions. Now, Paul preaching this and shifting his approach depending on the region he in, was in, doesn't make him less effective minister, doesn't make his call um, any different, doesn't mean that he failed in some way. It means that he's growing and he's learning. And he now is able to, years later, help other people grow and learn. You know, maybe that's a part of it. If, you're, if you've ever been in the situation I'm describing here where you're you think you're following God and you're feeling like it's a roadblock here and like, did I miss it, God? You know, it's always a good thing to consider, right? It's not a wrong thing to ask God if you missed it. But more often than not, you know, it's not that you missed it. It's just that something like this is going on. There needs to be a course correction, a change. That doesn't mean that you failed in any way. But what it could mean is that you're learning something that's going to help somebody down the road. Some of the greatest lessons that Sarah and I have learned that we have imparted to you guys, that we've preached over the years, that, that, that people respond well to, is because we learned the hard way. We learned so many things the hard way in ministry and in our marriage and all these things like, like that, right? But that doesn't change the fact that we're called, that we went through these struggles. You know, we've been... We've, we've, we've heard it all. You know, I, I joke around that, but it's, it's true that, that over the years, I have every major part of ministry that there is, I've been accused of doing it wrong. I literally do everything wrong. Nothing right. I even pace wrong. Y'all heard this one? Was it Sophia or was it Hannah that that, that that lady talked to? I think it was Hannah. Both of you, when they were still still young kids, we were in, in service um, in, in St. Cloud before um, before service. We were doing intercessory prayer, and in the earlier days, uh, Sarah and I led the prayer uh, more often, and 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 so it was before service even started. And I'm praying, I'm interceding, and I'm you know in Jesus' name, and we just lift up uh, our coverings right now, and, and, and this is what I do, and I'm just you know, I'm doing this. And she took in this this woman who had never been in there before watched me went to my daughter who I think had to be 11 or 12 at the time and said you know if he's going to pray like that and he's going to pace like that the least he could do is pace in a cross what i'm supposed to actually walk in the form of a cross to be more effective in my prayer that woman never even made it to praise and worship, you know, and and you know we can laugh at that. But then the, you know I've been accused of all kinds of other things too. You know we, we worship wrong, we praise wrong, we we do warfare wrong, and everything wrong. And and you know somebody's always going to have a problem if you're if, if you're doing the right thing. Somebody's always going to have a problem with it. Okay, now there's nothing wrong with with self examination. Anytime somebody accuses me, well maybe not with the pacing thing, but the others. Um, Anytime that somebody brings something like that, I don't go to them, but I do go to God. And I say, okay, God, is there any truth to it? Is there anything I need to learn, anything I need to know, is there anything I'm missing? I, I take a moment, I actually do that. And largely, the answer is, nope, you're good. But I take the time to do it. So there's nothing wrong with that. But my point is this, is just because, you know, people are accusing you and saying you're doing this wrong and this, this wrong and, um, and, and everything wrong doesn't mean that you're missing it. And just because you need to put your school on the shelf 
and restart it again four years later doesn't mean that you're missing it. Amen? And, and so I guess my encouragement for you guys this morning is this. Um, free yourself. Let yourself be okay with course corrections, right? With redirecting. You know, again, always be with the Holy Spirit when it comes to it, but, but don't beat yourself up because something that you thought was going to go this way isn't working out the way you thought and that you have to shift something, you have to change something, all right? It could be that in the shift and in the change is the very lesson that you need to learn to make everything successful, okay? Don't, you know, don't be so hard on yourselves. That's what I'm trying to say. Don't be so hard on yourselves. You know that, um, that usually we're harder on ourselves than, than God is on us? It's true. We're harder. You know, we usually have more forgiveness and grace for other people than we do for ourselves. Now, that's not an excuse to do the wrong thing, right? But if we're, if we're being honest, we're harder on ourselves than God is on us. And a lot of you, I'm just in a general sense, but a lot of you have too, too much of a spirit of perfection over yourself that you're holding yourself to a standard that God never held you to. Stop it. Stop it. There's lessons in the readjustments. There's lessons in the, in the redirections. Paul is living proof of that. Not, and there's lessons in it not just for you, but for others. Amen? Hallelujah. You guys get something out of this? All right, let's, let, let's pray. Father God, I just thank you that you're the great course corrector, that you see the end from the beginning. You're the alpha, the omega, the, the, the beginning and the end. And you have a plan and purpose for every single one of us. You have a, a, a mission and a ministry for every single one of us. And a part of the process is learning how to adjust. So, Lord, I thank you that you help us, that you're with us every step of the way. Um, Lord, I pray that every single one of us, just our hearts be open to self-examination, but also that, that we can cut ourselves some slack and allow ourselves to learn through the adjustments, that you speak to us clearly, that the words that have been spoken over us previously have not fallen by the wayside, that weren't missed, but they're still alive, they're still active, that you're breathing life into them even now. But Lord, I, I thank you. Um, really, you know, it's a grace and it's a mercy that he course corrects and allows us to course correct because we learn, we grow, and um, it, it, uh, it means that it's a way that God can get us out of our own way. So, Lord, help us do that. Amen? Amen. Can you, can you be in agreement with that? Say, Lord, help me get out of my own way. Hallelujah. How about that for a prayer? <laughs> Somebody give the Lord a praise. Amen. Amen. All right, real quick, we're going to close out service this morning. I almost said tonight. Uh, receiving our tithes and offerings. If you need an envelope, should be some of the seat backs in front of you. Uh, if you're writing out checks, you can write them out to high praise. And if you're using Tithely, you should already know how to use that. If you're watching back online, there's a QR code on your screen that you can scan anytime. And drop boxes are located on the sides and on the steps there. You can drop your gifts anytime that you want. But uh, God loves a cheerful giver because God is a cheerful giver. It's a part of who he is, right? Giving is a part of who God is. Um, God and God so loved you that he gave the most precious thing that he could. I talked about this in St. Cloud a little bit last night. Um, you know, it, God's after our hearts. You know, that God wants you. He wants your whole heart, all, all of you. And I talk about that all the time, that giving is a way of getting our heart right with God. But you know that, 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 you know that Jesus actually said it a little harder than I usually do? You all have heard me say this so many times if you've been around here any length of time. But Jesus said it harder. He said, where your treasure is, there your heart is also right? In other words, he's saying your, your wallet will, will show your priorities. Is God your priority? Because where, where you put your treasure shows your priority, not just your priority, your heart. Right? That's, that's strong. That's stronger than I usually say it, but that's Jesus, right? And a lot of people like to argue about tithe, the Old Testament, New Testament. I don't really like to even care about getting into that argument, right? I just, I'm, I'm like, I'm amazed that people argue so venomously against generosity because it's what it's really showing is your heart's in the wrong spot, right? And, and, and so 
I'm not here to tell you you need to tithe or you're not going to be blessed. I'm not here to tell you you have to do this or, you know, you know, guilt people into anything. I'm just telling you what Jesus said and that at the very least we should actually ask God about giving. What a crazy concept. And then, even crazier, be obedient to it. And I will tell you this, I, I, I don't think anybody has ever gone wrong by being generous. All right? At the very least, you're laying up treasures in heaven because you can't take it with you. Right? You'll never go wrong by being generous. So listen to God, be obedient to God, and, 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 uh, and know that it's not about, you know, and greed or anything like that. It's, it's about God wanting your whole heart, that he loves you that much, and he doesn't want to share you with the things of the world. That's it. It's out of love. And that we can give out of that same love back to him, and then he can bless us abundantly because we've removed the obstacles that are in our way that, that could kind of pull us away from him. So this is, this is just a principle anytime we give, wherever we give, right? Give cheerfully, give hilariously, be obedient to God, and just, just do it as an as a opportunity to do a little heart check, heart correction, and just give God some glory. Amen? So take your gifts in your hand. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for each gift. I thank you for each giver, and I thank you for this opportunity to sow into your kingdom. I thank you, Lord, that as we give this morning, your word says it's given back to us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I thank you, Lord, that you rebuke the devourer for our sakes, because we are cheerful, hilarious givers. And all God's people said... Amen. Amen. All right. Just quick announcements here. Um, the send is starting before you know it. Uh, um, it's not this thir- Is it not this Thursday? But is it the following Thursday? Wow. Okay. So we got got um, less than two weeks before the send starts. Um, that is our fall class. It's going to be eight weeks. The class is the Holy Spirit and His gifts. And, uh, and so we'll be right here at the church, 7 o'clock. It's going to be in person here in Brainerd, and we're going to be live streaming or live Skyping it uh, to St. Cloud. So it will be for both churches. But it's Thursday nights. Make sure you, you make note of that because we've typically done our, our uh, schools on Wednesday nights before, but we're shifting that. Um, so the Holy Spirit and his gifts, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be jam-packed and intense, but it's going to be good. Um, also, just a quick note, I know that Jason asked me about this and others asked about this. Um, so we highly encourage people to be at the class. We are, we are live streaming it to, uh, to St. Cloud, but we are not live streaming it publicly. Uh, however, we are recording it. Um, and so... We are not going to put the recordings out publicly, but if somebody misses a class, because you know, because we know life happens and things happen, you can request the recording and we will send you a link to the recording. Um, but we don't want people leaning on that. So if you miss a class, you can still get the recording, you can still watch it, you can still get credit for it, you can still get the certificate and, and the diploma ultimately if that's what you're after. So you don't have to worry about that. I want people missing out just simply because they have a wedding to go to or something like that, okay? Or, you know, it's going to be winter and... You know, the dreaded S word, snow, um, you know, something like that happens. Uh, so there will be that opportunity, but again, it's going to be right by request to get that link to, to the recordings, and, uh, and and we still highly encourage people to be here because a big part of the class is also going to be hands-on activation, doing doing the work. Make sense? So I, I just want people to know that there is an avenue. You don't have to... Um, um, worry about you know, snowstorms, weddings, or, you know, or being sick or something like that. Although we've rebuked sickness in the name of Jesus, and that's not going to interfere. Uh, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be a good class. And then um, finally, I, uh, I don't know if I have the graphic up. Did we? Is it gonna, yeah. Okay. Uh, our prayer push 2023 last. N- n- oh, that's, that's old. Is it going to refresh? Is it going to refresh or not? Uh, yeah, because I didn't check the computer. Um, but our prayer push 2023. Last night we busted through our goal of 7,022 hours. So, give the Lord a praise. If you don't know, we've we've had a year and a half. We're probably going to be a, a two-year journey in in praying in tongues between the two churches um, for for uh, praying for one another, praying for Minnesota, praying for the election, and most of all, we're praying for revival. And we set milestones along the way. And uh, last night we hit milestone number nine, which is 7,022 hours. Uh, so last I saw we were at 7,030 hours of praying in tongues. Um, and I, I just say that and point that out to encourage you guys. I believe every time we hit one of these milestones that we're going to see a level of breakthrough personally, uh, in our family, in the church and all that. But what the Lord had really told me about this level of breakthrough is we have to be aware of it and looking for it. 
We have to have eyes to see and ears to hear because it's going to be the kind of things that that people that haven't been praying for 7,000 hours in tongues aren't going to see. Okay? And so in this coming week or two or whatever, just 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 uh, have an awareness in your heart and your mind. It's like, God, what are you doing? What are you breaking through? I encourage you to go read Daniel 7.22 because that's where I got the 7,022. Uh, read Daniel 7.22. Get that in your spirit and be looking for... for uh, for, for God to to manifest that in your life, in your workplace, something something in some way, shape, or form. Expect God to do it. Um, as uh, this week, I'll set the next goal. Kind of have a fun idea in mind uh, for the next goal, and uh, and we're we're gonna make it a, an adventure. To when I pick the number, you're gonna have to figure out why I picked the number. I've got a fun idea. It's gonna be like a treasure hunt. Anyways, um, so. Anyways, uh, but keep praying in tongues. Keep entering your hours. Um, we're, we're getting close, you guys. We're uh, less than 3,000 hours away from our goal, which is awesome. Amen? All right. I think that is all I have for announcements. Father God, I just thank you for this morning, everything that you've done. And I thank you, Father God, that your word doesn't end here, but it continues to speak to every heart as we go about the rest of our week and the rest of our week. Lord, I pray as we go about our week that you give us divine appointments, divine assignments. Lord, help us to be lights to the world around us. Help us to be ambassadors of your love, um, those that spread your gospel, spread your kingdom in some way this week, in, in big way, small way. Lord, just help us to demonstrate the love of Christ to the world around us. In Jesus' mighty name, and all God's people said, amen. You guys are released. Have yourself an awesome rest of your weekend.